Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the first time attendees Capital Connections webinar. Uh, my name is Chelsea Neal, and I'm the Director of uh, Federal Government Relations for the Equipment Leasing and Finance Association. I have asked um, our great vendor, National Journal, to help us out um, and provide the first time attendees webinar. So I'm going to turn it over to Jackie Brewer to introduce herself. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for um, having me join you guys this afternoon. Um, my name is Jackie Brewer, as Chelsea mentioned, um, and I'm a senior advisor at National Journal. Um, National Journal has served as a staple to advocacy organizations like ELFA since 1969. Um, and in the last 15 years or so, we've started to really help organizations strengthen their advocacy efforts, especially around events like clients. Um, I currently work with over 150 different advocacy organizations similar to ELFA in Washington, D.C., and I'm excited to share with you guys the um, information to help you gear up for your upcoming meetings on Capitol Hill. So uh, first, we'll start off by just thanking ELFA for inviting um, myself and National Journal to come and speak with you guys today. As Chelsea mentioned, um, we have quite a bit of information to cover, and we have about an hour to do so. So moving uh, at a pretty good pace throughout this conversation, um, if you have any questions, feel free to just uh, put those in the chat box and we'll take care of those at the end. With that out of the way, I'll kick us off by providing a roadmap for our conversation. So we'll begin with some background for your upcoming meetings um, by contextualizing the, contextualizing the importance of fly-ins and more specifically your role in the advocacy process. Uh, then we'll talk about the audience or the staff that you can expect to meet here while you're in DC and give you a profile of the folks that you'll likely encounter during your meetings. Then we'll go through a quick review of the legislative process before moving on to what you can do before, during, and after your meeting to set yourself up for success. And finally, we'll close with some logistics and pointers as you make your way around Capitol Hill. With that, let's get started. So as you may recall from your civics classes back um, in school, we have the basics of how federal advocacy works uh, right here on this slide. So on the left-hand side, of course, you have Congress and the White House, which create laws and regulations that govern citizens. And on the right-hand side, we have us as citizens, and we influence those governing bodies. So it's a mutually reinforcing mechanism, as you can see. What's key is that we demonstrate and highlight the citizen interest in the political landscape. So how do we do this? Of course, ELFA has a very robust advocacy program, which you're a part of, um, and it does a strong job of encouraging you as members to make your voices heard by federal lawmakers. There are some specific ways we can demonstrate our interest here um, during our meetings. First, we can show our support. We can ask for change, we can tell our stories of our own experiences, and share ideas for how things can be approved and provide additional information. By doing all these things and by being here in person for the fly-in, uh, we not only make our views known, but more importantly, we act as a resource for those in Washington. Most importantly, in the bottom right, uh, you'll find a definition for the term fly-in. Although the term may be new to some of you, uh, maybe not for others, fly-ins have increased exponentially in the last decade, and members of Congress consistently say that they want to hear from us um, fly-in visitors. So why are fly-ins so important? Why do lawmakers want to hear from us as constituents? On the left-hand side, it's your feedback that guides policymaking. So you are the ones that are best positioned to educate lawmakers on how different legislative and regulatory proposals can impact your industry, your community, you as a constituent. And of course, our lawmakers wanna be sure that their actions are consistent with their voters' views. Otherwise, they may potentially be out of a job. So now we'll be communicating our views not only to the members of Congress, but also to their staff. Lawmakers frequently rely on their staffers to relay constituent views to them, and we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. In the middle, uh, you'll see among the various communications legislators and their staffers receive, personal messages are without question the most persuasive. As you can imagine, with technological innovations, the volume of constituent communications have grown enormously. So whether that's a phone call, an email, website comments, or social media posts, um, all of this uh, communication, we've seen a rise um, in form letters, 
So that's template letters. Um, and it's really the personalized communications that are going to be most compelling. So those individual stories that can provide a unique perspective that can shed a light on an issue for a member of Congress and their staff. Um, think about your own email. So how many emails do you receive a day, whether that's from stores that you may have purchased something from um, and someone you may know. Think about the subject lines that actually make you open that email, that communication. So we want to um, create a similar situation here. What's more, on the right-hand side, if a member or senator hasn't arrived at a firm decision on an issue, communications from their constituents constituents, um, and most importantly, those in-person visits from constituents are most likely to have an impact. Here's a look um, at this issue. So on this page, we share with you just the number of bills that have been introduced into Congress during the 115th Congress. So this is the Congress that um, just tied up in January. And as you can see, there were thousands of bills that were introduced. Um, so over 11,000 bills on the right-hand side. Of those that were introduced, uh, few were voted on, fewer still were, were either passed as a resolution or enacted into law. For example, looking at the 115th Congress, only about 3.8% uh, were enacted as law. So the vast majority of those bills failed to become a law um, and most never even came close. So even though this may be a discouraging statistic, there are two major takeaways um, from these statistics. First, given that a small percentage of bills will get a vote in Congress and fewer still will become a law, we all as advocates will need to be resilient and patient in our work. The second is that it's still important for your voice to be heard because even if those bills don't pass now, they can, they can play an important role for later. So those, spur, those bills can spur dialogue among the public and serve to motivate current and future advocacy efforts. Think about the most, uh, recent repeal and replace legislation that failed. This has led to a conversation for some who say it actually didn't go far enough and others who say it's gone too far. Without that legislation failing, we likely would not see such a robust dialogue around healthcare today. So it's through these discussions that advocates can inject a new perspective on an issue, a nuance that could lead to a constructive dialogue. So even though a concrete policy outcome may not happen today, um, it can still stem uh, future activity and dialogue that can have impact later. So uh, moving on, now that we have some context for how important the role you can play in the policymaking process is, let's take a look at some of the types of individuals you will likely be meeting with while you're here in Washington. So the first piece to keep in mind is that congressional staffers significantly outnumber members of Congress. On the left, we have the House, where in 2015, there were 435 members in the House, compared to over 6,000 House staffers. On the right, we have the Senate, which had 100 senators and close to 4,000 Senate staff. So in total, between the two chambers, we have 535 lawmakers that we're trying to influence. And of course, it's safe to say that ELFA advocates aren't the only ones trying to reach these lawmakers. Legislators only have so many hours in a day and many stakeholders to whom they're held accountable. So their work is supported by thousands of congressional staffers. Those congressional staffers would reflect both personal office staff as well as committee staff. Personal office staff are hired directly by that member of Congress and are just responsible to that member. They're more than likely from that district or state um, and the average representative in the House has about 14 personal staff while the average senator has about 30. Committee staff, on the other hand, um, are hired by the chairman or ranking member of a particular committee. They work for all of the members present on that committee, and they're less likely to be from a specific district or state that the chairman or ranking member may be from. And they tend to be policy issue experts. House committees average about 68 congressional staffers, while the Senate averages about 46. Given the volume of stakeholders and the number of meetings happening on Capitol Hill, fly-in advocates should expect to speak with congressional staffers in their meetings. So here we have a sample organizational structure for a congressional office. This is gonna be a personal office staff, so for a particular member of Congress. At the top, you have the lawmaker, and just below you have their chief of staff, who serve almost as their right-hand second-in-command. 
um, he or she will supervise their work in the office. Uh, they're the primary political advisor to the member with knowledge of what's going on in both DC as well as the district and the broad portfolio of issues that that member works on. Underneath the chief of staff, starting from the left, you'll see that there are four buckets. First, we have our legislative staff. Um, members are generally split into these policy focused groups as the legislative director, legislative aide, or counsel. These are people that are focused on analyzing, drafting, and interpreting policy. Then moving to the right, we have our communications focused staff. This will include our communications director, press secretaries. These people are focused on communicating the lawmaker's message to both the media on a national level as well as a more local level. We also have legislative correspondents and they're responsible for constituent communication. Then we have staff for the office. They typically deal with office operations. This will include the scheduler as well as any staff assistants. And then lastly, on the right, we have those district staff. These are folks that you may engage with when you're back at home. Moving on, you'll find a profile of different high level staffers. So to the next slide. Um, and you might encounter here while you're in Washington, people more oriented to policy specific issues in the member's personal office. So as we mentioned previously, and I'm, as I'm sure you can imagine, members of Congress are tremendously busy. They're often double booked for meetings, and you shouldn't be surprised if a member shows up or leaves partway through a meeting you have scheduled with their office. More often than not, these meetings are scheduled with one of the next three individuals. The chief of staff who serves as the member's right-hand man or woman, uh, he or she may be empowered to speak directly for the member on their behalf. Legislative directors or legislative assistants who tend to specialize in those specific policy areas, as we mentioned. And then at the bottom, you may also potentially meet with a legislative correspondent or staff assistant who may attend your meeting as a junior staffer or note taker. Something to keep in mind is given the unpredictable nature of the Hill, there is a possibility there is possibility that you'll end up meeting with a more junior staffer. That being said, while Hill staffers tend to reflect younger generations, they likely have enormous responsibility and do enjoy much credibility with the lawmaker that they work for. It's good to keep in mind that roles on the Hill can shift pretty quickly, so today's legislative assistant could be tomorrow's chief of staff. Establishing the relationships today can be pretty fruitful in the future. So moving into the next section, we'll review the legislative process. So we've illustrated how bills can take a long time to pass and need continual pressure on the part of advocates. Here we'll remind you all of what that process looks like and help illustrate how bills can be stopped along the way to passage. So how does a bill become a law? At the top, you have the lawmaker in either the House or Senate, and he or she can introduce a bill. Legislation can be introduced either in either chamber, except for any tax law, which must start in the House. Next, that bill will go to the relevant committee or sub subcommittee that has jurisdiction over that area of law or policy. There, the bill is debated and amended. Then if a majority of the group agrees, it makes its way to the House or Senate floor. There again, the bill is debated and amended, and in order to move on, in the House of Representatives, the Speaker must allow a floor vote, and in the Senate, a three-fifths majority is needed to end the debate. Once it gets to a vote, a simple majority is needed to pass the bill along to the next stage. If an identical bill is passed in both chambers, so both the House and Senate, the bill goes directly to the President. However, if there are differences, more than likely this bill will go into a conference committee to reconcile those differences. Most major bills do have to go to conference committee and then the combined bill will go to the president. At that point, the president can sign or veto the bill and Congress can override a veto by passing the bill in each chamber with a two thirds majority. Okay, again, so that is how a bill becomes a law, but how does a bill fail to become a law? Here is an outline of how a bill can fail. In this example, we have a, hypoth a hypothetical bill making its way through the Senate, but a House bill could face similar challenges. You'll see at each stage of the process, there is an opportunity for efforts to fail. If it stalls in the committee phase, if it fails a vote or a cloture motion, or if different procedural actions like filibustering, um, if any of these 
take place, it can prevent it from passing. So the red boxes along the process, the flow, will highlight a number of potential fail points along the way to passage. Now this may look like bad news or good news depending on whether you support or oppose a bill in question, but even if we make it through the process, there are additional steps to consider. After passage by both the House and Senate, a bill may still face some challenges. The president can prevent a bill from being enacted by using the power of veto, which Congress can then override with a two-thirds vote in both the House and Senate. A couple of other outcomes are still possible. Looking to the right-hand side, even if a bill is enacted, legal challenges can also be mounted to prevent enforcement of the law. Or the president can prevent it from being enforced through the use of executive orders or signing statements. Moving on in this next section, we'll cover the steps you can take before, during, and after your Hill meetings to set yourself up for success. So how can you prepare for your conversations? What should you think about as you conduct these meetings? And how can you follow up once you've left DC and are back in the district? So when communicating with policymakers, we tend to lead with the facts, maybe then we share an expert perspective, and then we tend to end with the impact on people. But what we've found, what National Journal has found through some of our own best practice research, is that stakeholders across the advocacy community tell us that we should focus first on creating that human hook, so leading with the impact on people. The chief of staff quote on the left-hand slide summarizes it pretty well. The most effective messages are the ones that go beyond the economic impact and talk about the impact that they are having on people's everyday lives. In other words, start with the elements that matter most to the policymakers, and that's the constituents that are being impacted. So how do we do these? How do we craft these awesome stories? Your stories are powerful tools for policy, and they can have a huge impact through your flying visits that ELFA has already arranged. And we've established that members want to hear from you. So ELFA will provide you with talking points on the issues you hope to communicate, but recognizing that time is at a premium, how can you prepare to ensure you are as persuasive as possible in these meetings? Here we've highlighted five key elements you'll want to consider in conveying your story of your own experience, the experience of their constituents. And at the bottom of the page, you'll see a sample articulation of each of the five elements. So first off, you'll want to start by re reinforcing your geographical tie to the office. Establish your relevance to that lawmaker. I am Jane Doe and I am from your district. I'm from your state. Second, make a reference to the member or senator's connection to your issue what you came to speak to them about. I know that this member is extremely passionate about small business, about tax reform, given their social media presence, and that's why I'm here to connect with them today. Third, if there's an element of urgency, why this issue matters right now, make sure to highlight that too. There is a bill coming up soon, or there is a hearing we want to have happen, and that's why I'm here today. Once you've established those three things, the geographical tie, the connection to the issue, and the sense of urgency, it's time for you to share your own experience. So explain to that member or senator what is happening, how it's had an impact on you, your community, their constituents. And finally, establish future contact. Invite them to an event back in the district, back in your state, promise to follow up with any additional information, and make a game plan for a next step. The goal here is to connect your story or experience to the issues, priorities, and activities that the lawmaker is already engaged on. Help them understand why your views are relevant and how your experience can add to their perspective understanding of the issue. According to a 2017 um, study from the Congressional Management Foundation, they found that when policymakers are making decisions, members of Congress primarily want constituents to answer four questions for them. Those are, what actions do constituents want me to take? Why do constituents want me to do that? What are the current or potential local impacts? And what are constituents' personal stories or connections to that policy? So again, what actions, why, what's the local impact, and what's your story? So as you prepare for your meeting, it's helpful to think through those th elements. And as you do that, it may also be helpful to consider how you might modify your message if a meeting is cut short or runs long. So that's to say, if you have 15 minutes, what will be your story? How will you answer what actions, why, the local impact, and your story? 
But also keep in mind, you may have a two minute elevator pitch. So how can you modify your story to still answer those four important questions? So during your meeting, um, you've prepped for those conversations. Um, what can you keep in mind while actually conducting these face-to-face -face meetings? What are we doing in the moment? The first key element is to be on time, no more than five minutes before that meeting starts. So not only is time at a premium, premium on the Hill, but so is space. Some of the offices can be extremely small and difficult to accommodate, accommodate early visitors. Of course, that being said, if you're going to be late, please let the office know in case another time needs to be arranged. As we've mentioned, those schedules are tightly managed. Second, be flexible. Recognize that you may meet with the member themselves or you may be meeting with one of their staff. No matter who you're meeting with, their time matters. As mentioned, a member may arrive partway through the meeting and if that's the case, don't feel obligated to restart the conversation. The lawmaker will ask questions if necessary. Third, focus on just the topic that's on the agenda. So those talking points that ELFA has given you, rather than introducing any new ideas, it will just dilute the conversation. Next, remember to keep politics out of the discussion. There is no need to make any reference to elections or campaign support. And finally, if you have any leave behinds, make sure that these are short one to two page documents that summarize your main points. These pointers are designed to help you position yourself as a helpful resource for that office. So moving into after those meetings conclude, one of the challenges that organizations often face is that the momentum around an issue often slips after a big push. So ideally, we'd be able to maintain momentum and keep activity and pressure up after our visits end. So more often than not, you'll see that drop down to our pre-visit engagement levels after you leave Washington. But how can you set yourself for success even after you leave? One element is recognizing that, fly, that the fly-in meeting is just a single step in an active relationship building process. So how can you keep that momentum up? There are a few concrete things you can do when you're back in the district. First, send a thank you note. Keep it short, remind them what you spoke about, and include links to any relevant research where it may be appropriate. Next, attend in-district events. Recall that members of Congress have staffers here in DC, but they also have staff, staff back home. Attend public events or town halls where the representative or senator is present and try to serve as a resource for the district staff. Finally, stay in touch, but don't over-communicate. There's a balance to be struck. Staffers receive hundreds of emails a day, so it's difficult for many of them to keep on top of their inboxes. But if you can provide new information that's relevant to your issue that ties it back to their constituents, and it will be helpful for those lawmakers, decision making or thought process, you may consider sharing it. The key is to engage in a way that you position yourself as both trustworthy and valued and an advocate for your issues. All right, let's close this out by going over just some logistics around your trip to the nation's capital. So first, the Hill is a relatively small neighborhood, but it's good to keep in mind how you'll get around. If you're coming by car, recognize that there are few public parking options and street parking is difficult. So you might consider ride sharing, Uber or Lyft as, as alternatives to driving yourself. If you do opt to drive, you'll wanna factor in time to find parking. Most folks will opt for public transportation, whether by Metro or Metro bus, the different subway lines are color-coded and there are four primary stations surrounding the hill. They are the red, blue, orange, or silver lines. Finally, even if you take a car or public transportation, you'll still be doing a fair amount of walking, so you'll want to wear comfortable shoes. The summer months are particularly hot and humid. Um, it sounds like you guys are coming relatively soon, so you're lucky on that end. Um, but it's good to keep in mind and plan ahead to ensure you can get around comfortably. On that note, we recommend business or business casual attire rather than jeans for the Hill visit. So that's just another factor to keep in mind in trying to keep comfortable as you make your way around DC. Here, we've got the layout of the House and Senate office buildings. You'll see the House is on one side of the Capitol and the Senate on the other. Rayburn, Longworth, and Cannon are the key buildings on the House side. On the Senate, we have Russell, Dirksen, and Hart. 
Again, looking at this map of Capitol Hill, it doesn't look very large, but looks can be deceiving. These are long blocks, large buildings. So definitely expect to do a fair amount of walking. This page is for your reference. It shows addresses for the key buildings highlighted on the prior page. Again, we have Rayburn, Longworth, and Cannon on the House side, and Russell, Dirksen, and Hart on the Senate side. Here, we've zoomed in on the house side of the map, so you'll see the three primary buildings. We've got icons on the map for the public handicap accept accessible building entrances. In the table, we have the abbreviations for the offices, along with an example of how to decipher the number system and examples in the last row of the table. So within Rayburn, the rooms are four digits long. The first number is always a two, and the second number indicates the floor. Longworth's numbering system is similar, except the first number is always one. Again, the second number indicates the floor. But Canon differs. Here, the rooms are three digits long, the first number indicating the floor. You'll see one example here. Congressman Steve Cohn represents the 9th District in Tennessee. His office number is 2104. The first digit is two, which indicates it's in Rayburn, and the second digit is four, which means he's on the fourth floor. We have the schematic of where the different rooms would be located within three house office buildings. Um, so if we're looking for Representative Cohen, 2104, we look for his office on the Independence Avenue side of the Rayburn building. Moving to the Senate side, again, we've zoomed in on the map. You'll see the three primary buildings, Russell, Dirksen, and Hart. Again, you'll see icons on the map for building entrances as well as handicap accessibility. In the table, we have the abbreviations for the offices, along with an explanation for how to decipher the number system and an example at the bottom. So the Senate rooms are all three digits, where the first digit reflects the floor. So look at the example here. Senator Schumer's office is in the Hart Building, office number 322, which indicates that's on the third floor. And again, moving to the next slide, the floor plan this time for the Senate office buildings with an indication of where different rooms within those buildings would be found. So if we were looking for Senator Schumer, 322 Hart, we'd look for him on the third floor in that corridor that runs parallel to the first street, closer to the C Street side of the Hart building. So just to recap, we've talked about the really important and unique role that you can play in advocacy through fly-in visits. We covered the types of individuals and staff that you'll likely meet with while you're on Capitol Hill and given you a sense of those different roles. We've reviewed the legislative process and talked about what you can do to set yourself up for success before, during, and after your meetings to have the most impact. And finally, we closed with some very tactical information to hopefully help you plan out your day while you're here. Hopefully you found this useful um, and valuable information. We're grateful to ELFA for the opportunity to share this with you all, and we'd be delighted to answer any questions at this point. So it says, will this deck be available to us? And it will be available to you on the Capital Connections website. Are there any other questions at this time? Please enter your questions, if you have any, into the group chat. We'd be more than happy to answer them. Well, if no one has any questions, um, and you do have questions, but you want to ask them offline, please feel free to reach out to me at cneal at elfaonline.org. Um, I'd be more than happy to answer them. This webinar will be posted in the coming days along with the slide deck. Um, thank you so much to Jackie um, and National Journal for coming to speak to us this afternoon. Um, we look forward to seeing you guys in just two short weeks. Have a great rest of your day and thank you.